everybody. Hi. So we're going to talk about big data at Heineken. Um, I think um, he thought about that being an aperitif. I think a beer is a much better aperitif. This is quite serious, but I'll make it as fun as I can. Now, Heineken um, is a legacy company, right? We have been brewing beer for two centuries. We're like all FMCG mass market. We were not born in the internet era. Digital data is difficult for us. And yet, we're on that journey, and our mantra for the last two years is marketing in a mobile-first world. Now, what does mobile-first mean? You're all at the Web Summit, you all know, but I want to share this fascinating fact with you, which I love, to explain to people why mobile is important. This is actually a study done by BCG at the end of 2015. So it's quite old. And 38% of people globally said they would rather give up uh, sex for a year than give up their mobile phone. Now, that means that mobile really is first, right? But what does that mean for Heineken? You can't drink beer online, and I don't think you will be able to soon. Uh, you can buy beer online, but it's still 1% only of the global market that's sold via e-commerce. Now, we're doing tons on that. Uh, I don't talk about it today, because the real burning platform is our communication. We spend over a billion a year on marketing media and sponsorships uh, to get our brand building going. And that is where we need to change. So we've been doing this marketing in a mobile first for the last couple of years, and we've been working a lot getting our advertising off TV, primarily, and into mobile, and then getting the copyright to work on mobile. That was the topic last year in the talk here, and also many talks I've given, and we feel that we're doing quite well. So what's the next key focus area for Heineken in data-driven marketing? And this is another chart I love. Actually, when I see my kids, this is what I see, and I don't like it. But it's a good in intro to the next uh, section, which is there's one advantage of people being slaves to their mobiles. When they're in a bar drinking beer, they're also with their mobiles, so we can communicate with them. And that's a bit of an intro of what we want to do. The big focus today is talking about what we call individualized data-driven marketing. It's a big mouthful, so we shorten that to IDDM. And essentially, it's about getting more personalized and relevant communications to beer buyers, right, to consumers. Sounds easy, but it isn't. And I'll take you through the different things that we're doing to try and achieve this now. First of all, what are our objectives? And there's some key words in here. The first is to build owned people data capabilities. At the moment, I'll talk later, we have very little data, right? Our beer is sold in bars, in stores. We don't know who's buying it. We have very little first-party data. And what we're activating now is third-party data through agencies. We don't own it. So we need to build it, and we need to own it. That's where it all starts. And to be honest, that's the most difficult for an FMCG company to do. The secondly, beer is a scale business. There's about 70% annual penetration of beer and everyone drinks pretty much every type of beer. So there's not, we have to do this at scale. So that's why we've put reaching 50% of beer and cider drinkers over time. If we keep it niche, it's never going to be interesting for us. And of course, do the personalized messaging. The second point is something really interesting, back to this mobile slaves. We can find people at the right time when they're drinking or about to buy beer. So we can link it much more directly to sales activation, which is the hardest thing to do in FMCG. Yeah? People see an ad, and then you don't know if they're going to buy a beer. You serve it the right place, you can get them more to buy a beer. And that links with the sales department as well. There's all these things we want to get moving. So why do we want to do this? And I love this. You know, um, Heineken's a Dutch commercial company. If you know the Dutch, they're very driven to sell, to make money. Um, this is what this is not all about. You know, you can do a lot of things in data-driven marketing, build a lot of personas, and so what? Will it help sell beer? We think it will. First of all, we think it will increase sales. I just explained that we can get sales activation much more directly from our communication. But essentially, it will improve our media efficiency and effectiveness. Let's talk about efficiency first. 
If, if um, the first thing we can do is managing frequency. Those of you in the business will know make managing frequency is important. We can make sure people are above the minimum frequency threshold so the communication works. And then we can do what's called frequency capping. We can probably save 20 to 30% of our budget by stopping sending messages too many times to the same person. Sounds easy, it's actually not, unless you have the people database and the MarTech stack to do this. And the second thing, we can stop sending messages to people who don't drink beer, which is about 30% of the global population on average, because that's a waste of money. Again, you need to know the people to do that. And in certain countries, certain beers like Spain next door, there's a brand called Cruz Campo we have. Everybody loves it in the south. Everybody hates it in the north. So you can really start separating where you send those messages and not wasting money on the people who are never going to listen to you. On the effectiveness, that's all about being more personalized, relevant, in the right context. The example I like to use is football. We sponsor the Champions League. There's a match tonight, and the Ajax are playing here. Uh, so you'll see a lot of Heineken about. Um, and most guys, let's say, and I say guys, nothing against the ladies, but I say guys because this is what they're into, football, and we target that. And most of them have a team that they support. If we can get that team on the first frame of our video, as people are scrolling down their first book, Facebook page, and they see their team, they're more likely to stop that hyperactive thumb and engage with the video and watch it. So it's going to be much more effective than a generic ad. That's the idea. But we need to know the team they support to do that, and we need the people database. The third area is something really exciting. We work with big media agencies like everybody. In the old days of TV and big outdoor, scale was everything. You needed the deals, the volume to get the deals. You needed to get the placements, the relationships. With things like Facebook, I can go on the Facebook buying platform and buy the same stuff that my big media agency buys. There's not much scale advantage. And by doing this in-house, we actually control what we're doing and a much more transparency. Because, of course, agencies make money from us by uh, buying things in a bit of a different way. So that's a big opportunity for the future, which I won't talk more about today, but I think it's a big theme for all marketing companies. Now, IDDM can be really complex, you know? You imagine trying to explain to the board of directors, the CEO, and even most of marketing people about what this is about. And then I get into the MarTech stack and uh, first, second party, third party data. Really complex. So I said, how do I make it simple? So this is a thing I always use, because it is dead simple as a concept. We start with people data. If we're going to mar market to consumers individually rather than mass, we need to know that. So that's the first thing to build. And as I said, it's probably the most difficult for legacy companies like us. And then from that, we need to build audience segments. You can have two audience segments, 10. You can have a million if you want. I'm not quite sure about the value of that for us yet. But you build those segments. Once you build the segments, you need to send tailored creatives to those people. Otherwise, it's a bit pointless. We call that smart creatives. So you've got to make creatives that resonate more with those se one segment than the other. Right? And then the final thing in this, which is also super important, you need to measure a lot more. FMCG companies are not that good at measuring because, especially in beer, because beer is very, you know, key benefit of beer is it's cool, it makes you feel good, it's football, um, it's Formula One for us. How do you measure the effect of that? There's a lot of intuition and judgment. With this, we can measure. We can do exposed versus unexposed, we can model, we can do infinite A-B testing to see what resonates and what doesn't. And just to say now, the proxy we use, because we're still very limited um, on measuring actual sales, you know, real effectiveness of our communication. So we use a proxy, which is what we call the video completion rate. So it's how many people watch our, say, five-second Facebook videos to the end. And that means that they're interested, so that's a proxy for engagement. So we measure that and we A-B test that, get rid of the ones they don't watch and use the ones that they do. And also, by doing all this measurement, that also feeds into the quality of the people data, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Sounds easy, but it's not. For Heineken, there's two big things. One is, it turns upside down the way we do marketing. We're used to producing big assets, big hero films, and then we'll do some digital assets, and then we'll give them to the media agency and say, right, 
distribute. Now it's much more coming from the individual consumers. We need communication that's going to resonate with them. So the, the communications agency got to deliver templates, you know, photos, texts that is put together in different executions for different segments or automatically in the future, we're not there yet, by uh, DCO, which I'll talk about. And to get marketeers and especially agencies to work like that, that is one of the biggest challenges we have. The second is to build capabilities. So internally, we hardly have any capabilities in this area ourselves. So I want to go through now what capabilities we're building and what we think is important. So what my experience in the last couple of years is what's important for FMCG to do and to change. So let's start going around the, the little circle. People data, as I said at the start, this is where I won't say we don't have any, but we don't have much. We have very limited first party data. You know, not many people go on the Heineken website. We don't sell much online. Um, so we need to learn how to do that. So I'll just tell you where we're getting now. First of all, we need to get people in who know how to build data strategy and content. Secondly, we're uh, deploying a consumer data platform, a CDP globally, so we actually have somewhere to manage that. And that industry is evolving all the time, so we have to get the right one. Um, and then, obviously, we're going to get much better at building first-party known data. The other key area is activating second-party data. For example, all our sponsorships, why don't we do data swaps? With retailers, we can do things. We're looking at installing EPOS in developing countries, so we actually know what someone's buying and what someone's selling, actually doing it ourselves. Uh, and the other key area, for those of you in media in the room, <coughs> what we don't do enough of now is tag of all of our communication. If we tag our communication and see that someone engages more with, say, a video about F1 than something else, we can build their profile. They still remain unknown, but we can build them to know more about that person and get more knowledgeable in our database about what's going to work with them and what's not. And we're starting to do that now. Of course, we need to be bringing on board data scientists. We have a few now. It's a bit of a rare breed in Heineken. But we need people who can analyze all this and actually work it out. And most of you here, I mean, you, a lot of you, I guess, are from tech. For you, that language is normal. You talk that to someone in our business, they've no idea what you're talking about. And this is one of the biggest things that I always advise to startups. Make sure you explain what you're doing in the simplest terms possible and how it's going to, in our case, sell more beer. So that's the first thing. And from all that, of course, you build your audience segments. The next one, and just thinking about this, I actually should have put MarTech stack in the middle with mobile first. So to do this, you need a marketing tech stack, which I guess you're all familiar with. We've actually got a really good one. We've built it um, with different vendors. We own it. We have the relationships ourselves. We've got a bit of a Formula One of a tech stack. But there's one big issue. We don't have many drivers. We have very few Formula One drivers. So it's like sitting in the garage. I wouldn't say unused, but we're not very good at using it. So we have to build all these capabilities. We have to bring people in, essentially, and also rely a lot on vendors at this stage. But we need to bring these capabilities internally. On smart creatives, I mentioned it. Um, this is just a huge challenge. We're doing this on Heineken now. We've done some of it, but this year we're really trying to get a whole focus on the Heineken brand in terms of IDDM. So get much more relevant, localized communication, obviously within the brand idea for Heineken. But that means that the agency's got to be delivering assets that are sort of work in progress to the operating companies, and then they will decide exactly what to do with them depending on what's happening. For example, there's the match tonight. Depending on the results of that match, uh, you can do a completely different type of communication in, in Portugal and in Holland, depending on what happens, what wins. If a cat runs on the pitch, which was one of the biggest th things that happened recently in, in, in UCL. So the agency has to get used to doing that. Secondly, you need the technology to do it, to serve and get to dynamic content optimization. There, we're working with partners like Innovid. And again, that's all new to us. Finally, measurement. We need to have what we call an ROI obsession. Um, one thing we're very much doing now is working with 
control cells versus exposed. You can do that. It's just like clinical trials. You create two different audiences, which are the same in, in quotas, and see what happens with those in terms of sales, different regions. And we're building in-house modeling techniques. But there's one really big final thing as well. Oops. So that's all the capabilities we need to build. And I hope that resonates a bit with you. Um, and certainly, I don't think I've missed anything that's important for us. But one of the big, big focus area is organization. There was a talk a bit earlier about silos. Um, marketing and sales have always worked together. But essentially, marketing have done the creative. And sales get out and get the sales and the distribution. With this, we need to work much more together if we're going to drive sales activation from this communication. So we call these things commercial digital acceleration units. We like complex things, CDAUs. And essentially, it's bringing together marketing, sales, and then all the enabling. So the data insights, CMI, uh, data technology, um, e-commerce, of course, because we're doing a lot of that even though it's small. Brings them all together in one unit, not necessarily changing the organizational structure. The reporting lines may stay the same. But bringing them together, you know, exactly from the tech world, like a pod of these people working on certain projects. Because that's the only way that you'll get, for example, in a, if you're in a bar and, um, and, and we know that someone's at work because they're there five days a week, um, we can offer them a Heineken 00. zero. If at the set of, and a communication. If at the same time the trade manager has done a deal with the restaurant chain, say, then they can get a free one to try, which is really important for us. And we can only do that if we bring marketing and sales very, very closely together. So that's really it, yeah? Getting capabilities, building the organization. And the question you may say now is, well, so what? What are your results? How are you doing? We only started, actually, in April this year doing this to this depth of intensity. Um, we've been very helped by BCG, a quick free plug for them, but I really uh, thought they were, doing, they were doing a lot of good things in this area, and we've learned by doing with them. They've shown us what to do, and we've got some good results. Uh, first of all, we have proven that we can get around 30% media efficiency gains by doing this, and a lot of it's simply getting into the DSP and seeing what the media agency is doing, getting much closer. To, to, to work on it ourselves. And we save a lot of money like that. In terms of sales increases, certain things where we've driven traffic to a store uh, with our sales colleagues when we're doing a promotion, we've got a 10% sales increase versus when we've not, you know, the non-exposed. So we are getting this increase. We've also even got big brand shifts in terms of brand equity we're starting to see. And this is all short-term measures. Over a year or more, we should be getting much bigger results. And I hope that this time next year, I'll get invited again, and I can uh, share the real fruition of this project, uh, which will take a few years. So quite a serious aperitif. I hope it was interesting. It's quite technical, but I think that's what you're here for. So uh, please enjoy some beer tonight, though. Thank you. <laughs>